Good morning. So today we get to go over the shortest document in the Bible. Did you know that? A little trivia for you Bible trivial folks, Tri Bible trivia people out there. The shortest document in the Bible. Uh, as we heard, uh, the, this is a letter uh, written by the Apostle John to a man named Gaius. <clears throat> there are two others mentioned in the letter, uh, Diotrephes and Demetrius. Uh, Diotrephes is thought to be uh, a member or a leader of a church in the same area as Gaius. They're not in the same church, but sort of close enough to one another that they know one another. And Demetrius is thought to be the guy who brings the letter from John to Gaius. Um, John's message to Gaius is one of encouragement and warning. Uh, specifically, John wants Gaius to know that he's heard that Gaius is walking in the truth, and he wants to warn him against Diotrephes, who apparently is not. Now, you may have heard me just say, walking in the truth. If you listened carefully to John's reading from the contemporary English Bible, it said, live, ac live according to the truth. You've heard me say this before. I use the New American Standard Bible, and the New American Standard Bible uh, translated that original Greek, as an aside, most of the English translations translated it this way as walking in the truth. So you're going to hear me say walking in the truth a lot. And when you do, if, you, if your mind is in the CEB, think live according to the truth. All right, with that as an introduction, uh, I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about what I think we can learn uh, from this letter regarding walking in the truth. Uh, specifically, what does it mean? Uh, what can we learn from Gaius? What can we learn from Diotrephes? And um, why I think this is all as important as it is. <clears throat> uh, before I get into that, though, I think it's probably worth spending a few moments talking about the definition or the biblical definition of truth. Um, I suspect, like us, in Gaius's time and John's time, truth had almost any meaning you would want to give to it. Um, and so, rather than just uh, assume we know what John meant, um, I'm going to try to help us think about the biblical definition of truth. Um, you know, we don't really know for sure, but you can tell just by the way John uses the word truth in this letter. Uh, we, we get some insight into how he thinks about the truth. Um, he uses phrases like the truth. And even he says the truth testifies. <clears throat> so even if we don't know exactly what his definition is, um, you can already tell that the truth is extremely important to John. I'll say it's absolute. He has one thing in mind. And it's very real. It's not a philosophical concept. You know, this is the truth has real impact uh, to, to John, I think, just the way he uses it. Um, thankfully, uh, we actually have some help with this from Jesus. He gives us two definitions of truth. Um, the first one most of you will probably think, you're probably already thinking of it, which is from John's Gospel, John 14, 6, uh, where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, right? So that's one, one definition, right? Jesus is the truth. But, but Jesus gives us another one later in the Gospel when he's praying over his disciples. It's in John uh, 17, 17, for those of you who like to, to write these things down. Jesus says to God the Father, he says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So, Jesus says he is the truth, and he says God's word is the truth. Now, if you're like me, that's both helpful and not, not as helpful as it might be, especially when Jesus says, I am the truth. And so, trying to doing some research, thinking about it, the definition I, can't, I found that sort of, or I kind of 
put together that helps me the most in thinking about this is that um, God's revelation to man is truth. Okay? It's not, not as simple as we might like, but I think that is a, a reasonable way of having a biblical definition of truth. It's God's revelation to us. <clears throat> And so if you think about it that way, it makes sense that God's ultimate revelation to us would be Jesus. He is God incarnate. There is no more revealing than having God walk amongst us, eat with us, speak, drink with us, speak with us, love us. Um, but, God, but Jesus also tells us that there's more to it than that, that God's spoken word and his written word is uh, how he's chosen to reveal himself to us. <clears throat> we know that in God's written word, he reveals himself as himself. He reveals himself as the creator of all things. He reveals the intended relationship he wanted for us with him and us with creation. And he also reveals how our fallen nature has not met his intentions. And he reveals, praise God, his plan for restoring all of that. Um, God also reveals himself in creation, right? We, we hear God spoke creation into existence. Um, you know, from creation, we, we, we know that it, God is immense. And he's, I don't think there's words, he's gloriously beautiful. He's, he's infinitely diverse and he's orderly. All of this is truth. John may have all of this in mind when he's talking about the truth in this letter, but I suspect he's primarily thinking about Jesus when he says truth. When he uses the word truth, I think he's primarily thinking about Jesus. <clears throat> I mean, I've already mentioned uh, John 14, 6, where where John writes, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth of life. But he says more than that. Earlier in the gospel in John 8, 31 and 32, he writes that Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you, really, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And lastly, in the, near the end of his gospel in John 18, 37, he writes this, Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. John believed Jesus to be truth incarnate. <clears throat> so, given all of that, when John uses the phrase walking in the truth, I think he's primarily thinking about when Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, then you will know the truth. Um, some of you probably know this, some of you may not know it, but in first century Judaism, uh, the rabbi, you know, there were a bunch of rabbis, right? The rabbi was more than just the teacher. It was more than just the words that the rabbi had. It was his life. Um, there's stories, I think, even to this day that uh, it was so important to follow the rabbi that people would like have their hair the same. They would dress the same. They would eat the same. They would walk the same. They would do everything that they could to look like the rabbi. And so for John, I think more than just the words, less, Jesus was, uh, he was the lesson for, um, for John. <clears throat> and I think, he, I think John took this to heart. I think, I think he, he lived this out. Um, I think you could make an argument uh, that John knew Jesus as well as anyone ever did. I mean, if you think about his life for a moment, right? He was with him through his entire ministry. He was one of the very first disciples called. 
he was one of a subset of the disciples that Jesus included in all these amazing things, the, trans, the transfiguration, healings. He saw things that only Jesus and a couple of other people saw. Um, he was the lone disciple that was with Jesus when he was hanging on the cross. He was the one that, that Jesus, when he's on the cross, entrusts his mother Mary to care for. Um, and it's John who I think, I credit Brian for this observation, you know, it's John who was so sure of his relationship with Jesus that he refers to himself as the disciple who Jesus loved. And so I think John knew Jesus in a way that... Uh, that few, few ever have. Consequently, he knew uh, the living truth of God. I, I say all of this about John because I think in him, uh, we have a great example of what it means to walk in the truth. Um, it starts and ends with following Jesus with the goal of looking as much like him as we can. I think John did this, and I think we're called to do the exact same thing. Walking in the truth is what makes us Christian. Um, John encourages Gaius in verse 12 to do this very thing when he says, Do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. I mean, obviously, the supreme example for us is Jesus. However, you know, I've already just given you one example, John, right? There are lots of other examples, right? There are stories about the saints in the church. There are brothers and sisters in this very room who um, are walking in the truth, who can be examples for us. And so, if you want to walk in the truth, know Jesus as well as you can, and look around you for those that you see Jesus in them and follow their example. I think, uh, in a way, this is, this is the very thing that uh, um, happened to those who knew Gaius. You know, verse 3, we, re we heard, For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth, that is, how you are walking in the truth. It's fellow, fellow believers who see Jesus in Gaius, and they're the ones that let John know about this. <clears throat> I want to point out that um, one thing that, that we don't ever hear in this letter is anything of, that Gaius ever said. Gaius is silent in this letter. Um, it wasn't what he said that demonstrated that he knew the truth. It was how he lived his life, and he lived it out in such a way that other people saw Jesus. Um, and I imagine that there were those uh, around Gaius that were following his example, um, just as John had encouraged them to do. So I want to shift a little bit from Gaius to Diotrephes. Um, so I'm going to read to you what John wrote um, in verses 9 to 11. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words, and not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. The contrast between these two gentlemen is pretty stark. While Gaius serves, Diotrephes loves to be first. Gaius apparently submits to John's input, while Diotrephes does not accept what we say. Gaius loves the brethren, even ones that he doesn't even know, while Diotrephes uh, does not receive them and forbids others.
from receiving them. And lastly, while Gaius apparently lets his life be his witness, Diotrephes likes to proclaim his righteousness by unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And the terms that John uses in this letter, he never calls Diotrephes out as not walking in the truth, but I think we can conclude that that's what he's got in mind because he essentially goes so far as to say what Diotrephes is doing is evil. <clears throat> so I wonder what happened to Diotrephes. Um, I doubt very much that he's as bad as he sounds in this particular moment. That I, I, my guess is there's a lot more to, to him and to this story than we have. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think we read God's word very well if we look at these stories about these people and just lump them into they're good and they're evil. Um, it seems like what God's word te is teaching me, is teaching us, is that except for Jesus, we're all fallen. And for those of us who are, who are trying to follow Jesus are in some state of restoration. And so I can confidently say Gaius didn't walk in the truth 100% of the time, and Diotrephes wasn't evil 100% of the time. But that doesn't really, you know, so what happened? What happened to this guy, right? Because his position, the implied position or way you could read the letter, it implies that he has some standing in a church. And so you wouldn't think he'd have that if he'd been this way the whole time. You know, something happened to him along the way. <clears throat> one, one clue we get from John's letter is, is that I think we can say that Diotrephes uh, was struggling to submit. Uh, he wasn't submitting himself to John. Uh, he wasn't submitting himself to others. He wasn't serving others, submitting to himself to others. And I think most importantly, he wasn't submitting himself to the truth. Um, in a way, this isn't, this isn't really a surprise. Um, I think, I think when I think about the story of the garden and the fall, you know, to the extent that that story teaches, teaches us about all of us, about me, um, it essentially to me teaches me that, that the struggle to, to submit to the truth is something that we have always had and will always have. I mean, if you think about it, what is the question that, uh, the serpent asked Eve in the garden, did God really say that? At its core, I think you could think of this question, is it about our submission to the truth? Are we going to obey God's truth, his revelation to us, or are we not? I mean, it, it doesn't get any more explicit in the, in the garden story. God spoke these words to Eve. Adam and Eve directly. No in-between, you know, no Old Testament, no New Testament, no, bam. And they, like me, decided, I don't, I don't need to submit to this. <clears throat> I, I know better. And so, you know, Diotrephes, I don't think, suffers from, suffered from anything that none of us, that the rest of us don't suffer with. But I think the truth also teaches us that um, we should submit to one another. And I don't think he did that. So recall what Paul wrote to the Philippians. Joan sort of mentioned it earlier when she was doing the recap, but I'm going to read from Philippians 2. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Nothing. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As I was working on this sermon, I was working on it a very long time, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you can't tell it now, but it's taken forever. Um, Jen was preaching from First Peter. And uh, as she was talking about First Peter chapter 5, she read these words. And I, I was in... In, I was preparing for the sermon, and I heard diatrophies just being screamed out when I heard this. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You, younger men, likewise be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Ouch. <laughs> um, and so, so walking in the truth, right? Diatrophies at this point, he's, he, he has stumbled a bit, right? <clears throat> I think it's, it's clear that he's stumbled. Um, but this still doesn't sort of help me think about, well, what changed? If he was walking in the truth at one point, and he's not now, what happened to my man Diotrephes? And I'm going to go to 1 Peter again, uh, chapter 5, verse 8. He says, Be sober and alert. Your enemy, the devil, like a roaring lion, is on the prowl looking for someone to devour. Peter says the people of God are in a battle. Uh, we read it elsewhere in Scripture. Uh, my problem, and perhaps Diotrephes' problem, is it like me? I don't think I take that to heart. Um, I mean, it, Scripture's filled with warnings about this, and yet I think it's easy for us to, I don't know, be blind to them, to not like them, to not believe them. I mean, one of the things that we have in this country is we have freedom, freedom of religion. We can't, you'd be hard pressed to convince me that any of us are persecuted for being Christians. And I think it's easy. And so um, we don't necessarily feel like we're in a battle. I don't know Diotrephes' story, but um, I think that perseverance is required to walk in the truth. You know, it doesn't come naturally or easy. If we take the easy route, I'll bet you in a heartbeat we'll find we're not walking in truth anymore. Um, Father, Father Alexander Schmemann, who is one of my favorite authors right now, most of you have probably never heard of him, but... He says this, he says, Christianity is not merely emotion or feeling. No, it is an encounter with truth, capitalized. It is the heroic effort of accepting truth with the entire being. I thought that was pretty good. Um, the battle or the roaring lion on the prowl um, however you want to think about the enemy or the struggle or the challenge that we face, 
dealing with this requires intention, perseverance, and most importantly, humility. Um, and I, I think in this case, the reason that humility is so important is because as we walk in the truth, we are going to find that we are actually not walking in the truth as much as we think we are. And so it takes humility to, one, look at, look at your life in that way, and, and it takes humility to actually repent. <clears throat> Thankfully, <laughs> right, the truth teaches us that God is a merciful God, and that what he desires from us when we fall is repentance. Right? I mean, when you think about Jesus, when he confronts He's confronted with a sinner. Someone parades a sinner up in front of Jesus, right? And what does he do? He almost always says, go and sin no more. <laughs> go and sin no more. Repent. Just start over. Um, I, think, I think Jesus calls us to repent the first step we take with him and every stumbled step after that. It's not a one-time deal. I think, you know, thinking back on, on what John writes to, uh, writes to Gaius about Diotrephes, in verse 10, he says um, that he intends to call attention to Diotrephes' deeds. Now, you could read that as John's going to pray this guy up and give him the what for publicly. I don't, I don't think that's a good reading myself. I think John's going to confront him personally. Why? Because he wants to restore him. He wants to lead Diotrephes into repentance. He wants him to return to the man that he once was. And, he, and, and, I, and I believe that because, again, John saw Jesus do this over and over and over again. It's what's in his heart. He's following his, his, his master, his leader. Um, I want to go back to a moment to one of the things that Jesus says, which is, that it's, I think, easy to miss. And, and it's different than how most of us think about the truth. Jesus says, if you follow my teaching, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Did you catch it? You have to follow him first. You don't learn the truth and then follow him. You follow him, and as you follow him, you learn the truth, and as you do, you are set free. And so <clears throat> following Jesus is, is, is walking in the truth. It is what we, what we do. And I think as you do it more, like I said a moment ago, you're going to find that, that your life doesn't, doesn't look like his. But we repent, and we keep going. And so I bring all that up to sort of close this on diatrophies by saying, I think he just forgot this. I think he wasn't, I, think, I don't think he persevered. You know, I think he just, he, he slipped. He let the old, the old, the old man rise up. <clears throat> so I'm going to shift now and kind of move to what I think is the heart of the letter in a way. And that is um, in verse 4 where John writes, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. When I think about John's life, um, it's easy for me to imagine he could have said a lot of other things were his greatest joy. He knew Jesus like no one else. That seems like a pretty, pretty joyful thing to me. Um, you know, his greatest joy was just to see these amazing things that were done. Or his greatest joy was he himself did these amazing miracles for God. That'd be pretty cool too, I think, right? <clears throat> but instead of all of that, he says no. His greatest joy is to hear that his spiritual children are walking in the truth. For John... Walking in the truth meant that his spiritual children were following Jesus, which means they were experiencing real life. 
They were experiencing eternal life. I mean, his greatest joy was that those he knew and cared for are actually living life the way God intended it to be lived. Said another way, they are no longer dead, but alive. They've been set free. I think John felt this way because he um, he had experienced it himself. We don't know all of John's story, but we have a data point that suggests John went through a pretty big transformation. Recall the story in Luke chapter 9 when the Sumerians want to reject Jesus. Who is it that wants to call down fire to destroy him? James and John. That's a little different attitude if you ask me. So, so by the time John writes this letter, his greatest joy maybe has, his, his greatest joy now is new life compared to like having the ability to call down fire and destroy the Samaritans. He changed over time. I mean, John had walked his entire life in the truth and um, it's also, I think, important to remember, because sometimes, sometimes when I think about the apostles, I think, wow, they were with Jesus. Of course they're super holy guys, right? Well, in a sense, that there is truth in that. John, Jesus picked them for a reason. But John walked with him for three years. He spent an awful lot more time walking with the spirit of Jesus after Jesus' death and resurrection than he did with the man. I bring that up because that's where we are, right? We're walking with Jesus' spirit. We're not walking with him alongside us. And so um, as John did that, he was transformed into this new man. <clears throat> so what's your greatest joy? I'll let you think about that for a minute. This isn't a call it out or break up into groups. I would never do that to, to, to you. <laughs> I'll just say I know my joy, is my greatest joy is not the same as John's. That's, that's not really a big confession to you folks. Um, but I believe it should be. So, I pray that we would all be people who um, would just persevere in walking in the truth so that one day our greatest joy would be the same as John's. <clears throat> I said I'd close all this by talking about why, why this is all important or saying a few things about that. Um, you've already heard it, but... In the simplest terms, right, walking in the truth means that we're following Jesus. It means submitting our will to God the Father, just as Jesus did. It means living life the way God had intended it, the way he revealed it in Jesus. And I think it means experiencing real life, eternal life. Walking in the truth is what makes us Christians. And here's the coolest part of all, is that we never, ever do it alone. In fact, I don't think we can do it alone. Um, it's his spirit within us, guiding us, convicting us, helping us whenever we stumble, or excuse me, whenever we stumble and whenever we submit to it, um, so I think in this letter, we have the story of one who continued, who persevered to allow, to submit to the Spirit, to help him to walk in truth. And we have a story of one who didn't. You may not think of yourself this way, but I would offer that we are all spiritual children of John. Jesus uses the apostles to spread the gospel. 
It's through them that every one of us who knows Jesus. So we are all spiritual children of John. <clears throat> I pray that we would persevere in submitting ourselves to the truth so that our lives would cause him and the heavenly hosts much rejoicing. This is the Christian life that brings salvation to the world. Amen.